Hello? Hold on. Yeah, hello? Hey, hello. Yeah, what's hello. up? Oh, not much. Um, I just figured that you and I got off to a bad start last time I talked, and I guess I've kind of come here to, uh, with a truth, so to speak, because you and I really have a lot more in common than not with respect to our political goals. And uh, I did want to talk about your debate with Jason Unruh last night. I had a few questions. I was wondering if you'd be willing to entertain. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think you had some good points on your side, but I also think Jason had some good points as well. So uh, I guess, I don't know, man. How'd you feel about it? Um, I, I just stand by what I said, and that's it, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so I guess the uh, first first thing I wanted to ask about is, uh, you did mention, though, at, at one point during the debate, like, you agreed with decolonization, right, as a concept, because you were saying, like, let them, let them Native Americans decolonize, right? Well, I don't know if I agree. I don't know what decolonization necessarily means, because it, it seems like it means a lot of things, especially as how leftists use them. But what I was trying to say is that um, if all your, like, I'm not going to get in the way of Native Americans doing what they want to do. I it's just, but I'm also not going to go out of my way to, um, you know, virtue signal and make a platform that says that's primarily focused on um, the indigenous question. Well, on the other hand, you know, a it can be included somewhere in the platform and within a general platform of land reform to give Native Americans, you know, their, their specific demands for reparations and land and whatever they're asking for and self-determination. But... I just think it's a form of virtue signaling to focus on it. Yeah. I would say I kind of agree. Um, it, you shouldn't make your entire platform about it, but it is worth noting. You are right about one thing. There are a lot of different ideas with respect to decolonization, like how much land there is to give back, what land to give back, uh, what groups should be given land. I think that there are more obvious examples of it, like... Uh, what do you know of the Lakota Sioux and the Great Lakota Sioux War of 1876 and uh, the stealing of the Black Hills from the Lakota Sioux? I don't know anything about it. Oh, um, well, briefly, uh, there was a war called the Great Native American Sioux War. And uh, in 1876, uh, the United States government basically stole the Black Hills, which were a group of mountains from this union of four tribes. And they went on a king's group spree, basically massacring a bunch of Native American villages, deporting a bunch of children, sending them to Catholic schools, for forcibly sterilizing Native American women. Real fucked up shit. Well, to this day, uh, the U.S. government has apologized and has offered like a multi-billion dollar grant to the Lakota Sioux, but the Lakota Sioux refused the grant because they just want their land back. So the example there is just give them back the Black Hills. That's one example of decolonization in practice. So I think to the point to where it's pragmatic and where it's useful, um, I think that decolonization is a reasonable goal to include in a revolutionary program of sorts on top of other things. Uh, what do you say? I, I mean, I don't really have an issue with that. Uh, there's nothing about that that sounds especially ridiculous to me. But again, um, it's not something that I would make a selling point for a platform sure. to sell to the American sure. people, but it's it's something sure. that is seems reasonable to me, and you know I have nothing against. But I just think fo like making that the the cause of your um making that like the basis of what socialism is in America is just what my issue is, you know. That's something I think can be included, but I just have issue with people who just are overly moralizing it and just making it seem like socialism is just about a moral rectification yeah. of the past rather than something that's meant to address the present here and now. Yeah, I would say that I agree with you in general. Um, the arc Jason was coming from a very moralistic standpoint when he was making the arguments that he was. 
I'm coming from more a Marxist standpoint where I think that decolonization is perfectly within the Marxist tradition because you're what are you giving back to the workers? Land. What is land? Means of production. So I think it's perfectly in line with the Marxian tradition. But uh, let me ask you something. So if you don't think that decolonization is an, is an issue worth prioritizing as part of a revolutionary program, then what are some issues that you think are worth prioritizing within a revolutionary program within the context of the United States? It has to be a program that addresses the present, urgent, and... Um future or near future interests and demands of the American people that preside okay. within um, the United States, the majority of the American people, right? Chinese constitution or the party constitution says the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people. And I kind of agree with that. The overwhelming majority of the American people's interests. So it has to, it has to be things that attend to their needs. Like, you know, I, I put out a hypothetical things like land reform is probably the most important thing, whatever that means, housing, things like that, um, infrastructure, things that are going to address the situation with this new fourth industrial revolution. Um, those are things I think which should be prioritized for a party. Yeah. I think uh, I can think of a couple other good issues as well. Um, the biggest one that's on my mind right now is the raising of wages and the shortening of the work week. Because... The, the, the shortening of the work week is definitely one that I, oh, yeah. uh, I yeah. think is uh, very much should be prioritized. Yeah, um, coinciding yeah. coinciding with the raise of wages to compensate for the loss yeah. of hours, of course. So, well, in the yeah, I I don't know so much about raising wages. Um, that could also be in the form of UBI. That could be in the form of other things. It could also be in the form of just high quality jobs that can be high paying. Um, yeah. Like high skilled labor for, uh, say, yeah, um, or or it could be you could follow the kind of Chinese model of setting up vocational schools, uh, to prioritize high to prioritize um hands on labor, kind of real jobs over these kind of bullshit degrees that yeah. a lot of students seem to be pursuing, and also yeah, this yeah. kind of over professionalization of oh, where yeah, people, yeah. Yeah, 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 people like most work that we do, like the fact that we have like. We had like upwards to 40% of the population out of work for months at a time last year. And the fact that we were still able to keep civilization running through all of that, despite the fact that like over a third of the workforce was out of commission, goes to show how much pointless shit people do. Like we can have all this spare freed up labor and still keep civilization running, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. We need to transition to a uh, list of jobs program or have a job program a guaranteed job program that's more towards what is beneficial to all you know so i'm, I'm with you there uh trying to think because there were a few things i wanted to bring up in regards to that debate um i feel like you two talked over one another a lot and it was very difficult i, I feel like there was kind of a disconnect so i wanted to ask you about something else um so you described jason as a calvinist uh, I yeah. was just wondering, what, what did you mean by that? Um, I just mean it in the sense of there's just a very common leftist attitude toward the world and toward America, which is where people are just all too comfortable with this idea that the entire world is fallen, depraved, and evil. And I just suspect, I highly suspect, and I do believe that this has actual theological and cultural and historical origins in um, Calvinism, right? Things like Calvinism where... People just get used to this idea that everything outside of individual uh, morality and spiritual morality is completely bad and false and that the only path to salvation lies in the kind of individual, um, what is it? No salvation without, what is the word from Protestant? I don't know. But it, it just seems very bizarre to me that someone can look at the reality in which we live, where we eat, breathe, live, and, you know, um, get by and have kids in, have families in, and then just at the same time say this is all fundamentally false and evil. There is no kernel of material reality here. There's no kernel of any reconciliation, any goodness. It's all uh, a crime and it's all a lie. Right, right. So you feel like because Jason was characterizing the foundation of the United States as by what it had to do in order to be established that he ultimately has a very bleak and fatalistic worldview. 
Well, I think the reason for that is because he has this idea that because of those origins and those foundations um, that enabled the possibility of America, that the whole essence of the United States has to be um, defined that way, defined by its immorality, according to him. And in that way, like all of America, the United States is a complete lie. It's a complete crime. Um, the United States of America must be completely dismantled in our heads. We cannot be patriots. We cannot um, recognize any continuity between the Communist Party and the history of the United States. Um, you know, that's that's really kind of where I'm coming from with that. It's just like, right. Right. So, yeah. so let me ask you something. What does uh, socialist American patriotism mean to you? Because that's a word I've actually seen... Um, Jackson Hinkle mentioned on Twitter and Caleb Maupin has even referred to as himself. So I was wondering, um, cause I saw your guys' stream, the three of you together and it was a good stream, but, uh, what exactly, what, what to you does, um, socialist or American patriotism mean? Just so patriotism basically means a love of country and country is something very vague, you know, is country state? Is it people? Is it land? And it's, it's kind of, um, sort of a blend of all of those things, but not really just exclusively one. Country is basically a people, their traditions, their polity, and their land, basically. Right. So to be a socialist patriot, to me, means to be one who has a love of their country and its people um, and its history, right? And is willing right. to actually step to the fore of succeeding their country's uh, history and continuity as um you know uh the rightful heir like to be able to succeed the american political project and give it a new meaning rather than just trying to liquidate everything and say it's all completely false america um we should only strive to virtue signal negativity toward all things american and because america all belongs to indigenous people yeah so in regards to um, I guess my thoughts on this is when uh, Jason made his criticisms or his jab at Maupin, and this is something that I was kind of trying to mediate. But, uh, from his perspective, I think either it's a misunderstanding or a misrepresentation of your position um, that uh, I, I guess it's the desire to uh, uphold the current state, because I'm assuming you want a new state, like a new actual socialist state, because you and Caleb Maupin, or I, at the very least from what I've heard from Maupin, has talking a great deal about having a government of action that actually cares about working class families. Um, that is not our current government of act. That's not our current governments, basically. And the idea is, I don't necessarily personally have a problem with the idea of loving liking the country you can like the country and the people within it it's the state that i have issue with because it's the state that upholds the property rights of the ruling class and that is ultimately what needs to be tackled with and overthrown yeah i mean the the issue to me is that on the one hand you have the objective and material state which also includes the deep state the military industrial complex the two ruling parties um, special interests, establishments, things like that. On the other hand, by American state, we also have things like the continuity of the laws and the, the Constitution and, you know, things like that. Um, the the, the so-called institutions of government that have been here for hundreds of years or whatever, but really don't represent the material reality of the state, but are just the kind of formal institutions. And... While I think it is inevitable that these institutions will be changed, I think they will be changed, the institutions that are hundreds of years, so to speak, old, um, they won't be changed by wiping everything away and then building everything from scratch new. Um, whereas when it comes to the establishment, the military industrial complex, the special interests, the corporate lobbyists, the, the two-party system and the, the ruling parties, those should be um, striven to completely kind of wipe away. But the kind of foundation atop which they rest, right, which, isn't, which is not the material state, but the formal state, um, to me, a proletarian dictatorship would be a layer on top of that rather than something that just uh, is completely entirely new and, and there's no continuity between them. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
so then i your vision of the future isn't necessarily involve the complete and outright overthrow of the present state but it involves the state as we know it now plus a new proletarian see i'm trying to understand no no want- effectively it is the overthrow of the state effectively the state as it materially exists but things like the constitution and this you know the, the the old 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 institutions of government which even you know like um these libertarian militias uh still believe in they're targeted by the state and they're completely big the biggest enemies of the state some of them right but they still actually believe in these like older more fundamentally older institutions um these old institutions i'm talking about are not really the state as it materially exists it's just the form of the state and to me a proletarian dictatorship would be a form of um it would be in continuity to that form rather than just wiping it away completely and building something new. So effectively, yes, I do believe in smashing of the state machinery and whatever. But formally speaking, as far as the Constitution and the civil institutions are concerned, a communist party should not be having the platform of just trying to completely abolish everything. Because yeah. for, uh, formally speaking... um. You know, you don't see in the Constitution any place for the deep state. The Constitution doesn't talk about the military-industrial complex. It doesn't talk about um, corporations and, you know, the the banks and even things like the Federal Reserve. It doesn't talk about um, the two-party system. It doesn't talk about the Clinton machine or the the Bush dynasty. None of those things are in the Constitution. So if you get rid of all of the things that that have been an outgrowth of the formal state that's like a kind of that's almost like a a year zero in a way you know right right i'm sorry i was just uh spacing out a bit um that you know i'm kind of glad you brought this conversation up because i think we can have an interesting discussion about this um i'm trying to exactly uh i don't know maybe i don't know what it is i'm not trying to or not comprehending, but I'm trying to understand uh, exactly what you mean. So you're saying that the families, the politicians, and the people that are currently involved in the current state apparatus are not a part of the formal state, or uh... the, yeah, exactly. It's it's an establishment which is kind of an outgrowth of formal democracy, but is not like nowhere is it written in our formal democracy that these these things should exist. In fact, they're starting to become a threat to formal democracy in the form of court rulings like Citizens uh, United, which says that corporations are individuals legally, right? And this is like so fundamental as far as formal democracy is concerned um, that, you know, they are starting to rewrite the foundations. You know, it's, it's, it reminds me of Stalin's last speech he gave. And he basically said that, and I have to paraphrase him because I don't have it off the top of my head, that in the bourgeois uh, democracies that currently exist, there used to be a period in which civil liberties, the right to as- of association, the right to a free press, um, democracy, those kinds of things used to be upheld. But now in the era of imperialism, these things are being trampled over and no longer respected. And communists should seize the banner of the old bourgeois liberties and seek to not only defend them, but um, carry them forward, right? So that's kind of where I'm coming from with it, is basically I see that formal democracy, that is the Republic, the United States of America, formally speaking, as something that communists need to embrace. Now, in practice, that doesn't mean um, no, it doesn't mean bowing before the establishment, which is the two-party system, uh, the Democrats, um, the you know, the special interests, the people who are actually in power right now, but it means competing with those people over the legitimacy of the American state. If that makes sense. Right, right. Um, so, what is the? I want to understand what kind of strategy you're in favor of, because. I know that I said some things like off air. I have characterized you as a rightist, and I can explain why I said you sound yeah, like Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't care. It's okay. I yeah. really don't care. Yeah, honestly, dude, the only reason I have is because in the past, I've heard your uh, characterization of general strikes, um, and apparently 
you know, I don't want to misrepresent you, dude. Are, are you for or against general strikes? And are you, I think I've heard you say that boycotts are a preferable alternative. We can have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. So th that's that's a really big misrepresentation because my, my point wasn't that I'm against general strikes, but whether or not general strikes um, are things that can be planned directly in the current era, whether general st strikes still have the same significance as they used to. Now, I, if I'm proven I, wrong and there's a big general strike, you know, far be it for me to come out and be against it. But I, would, I yeah. If I may interject, I would say that there is a general strike going on in the form of the people. There's a good sect of American workers right now that are not going back to work. And it's because they make just as good, if not better money off of unemployment. So there is a kind of hidden general yeah. strike for a national labor shortage. Right. And but, as a result, a lot of uh, employers are having to raise wages to encourage people to go back to work. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but Biden said that this was also an intentional policy of his. Um, that's what he's saying, apparently. But that's actually a good example of what I'm talking about, because that's an example of something that's not a form of direct action, right? It's, an, it's a result. It's kind of indirect result of a more general... Um, policy in the form of these kind of checks and unemployment checks and uh, coronavirus relief packages passed by the government, which is leading to people to not go to work, right? But that's not something that, you know, is the same as like the model of um, economic class warfare that existed in the 20th century, which is ge um, strikes or general strikes. And what I was trying to say when it came to boycotts, and I think actually uh, Grayson was making the argument to one of our notorious trolls, stalkers, and harassers, Sage, was that um, today it seems like boycotts have taken on the significance that strikes used to. So this is not a prescriptive claim that we prefer boycotts to strikes, but it's a descriptive claim about what the form of mass economic action has become in the 21st century. Oh, you're finished. I, I didn't know you were, but... Yeah. I would say that even though it's not really an official general strike, it really isn't. It's just people not going back to work, but it has the same effect because wages are going up, benefits are getting better, and uh, and employers are having to find ways to entice people to go back to work because even cutting unemployment isn't really cutting it anymore. So it actually, in a sense, it actually has worked. I would say it's you're right in the sense that it's not really like direct action. It's very much an organic uprising, similar to the George Floyd protests of last year. The issue is that there's no ideological guidance at the helm. There's nothing taking charge of it and channeling in it into calcified demand. And that's the reason why the establishment has often co-opted these movements. They've co-opted them because of the power vacuum that's left in the wake of these protests and these strikes and the refusal for people to go back to work. And my question is, how can communists today take charge of that? How can they take advantage of that to calcify it into a set of reforms and into a pro and hopefully on into a program that could fundamentally alter change for the better, you know? I, yeah, I, I just don't see them, these things as the site with for, uh, that communists are able to intervene in. I think Today, the economic and political struggles seem to have coalesced in the form of general political programs for policies because, because of the unprecedented level of socialization that we live in today, um, the, there is an unprecedented level of intervention in the economy by government politics. So instead of everything taking place on the factory floor as it used to, and this being the primary site of um, the economic struggle, um, it seems like political programs have the dual effect of also being economic. So the dualism of political and economic, to me, seems to have been overcome already. Um, now, I'm open to being proven wrong on this because it is kind of suspicious that it, like, the economic struggle seems to have just disappeared. But maybe I, it is still going on, but I'm just missing it. But um, especially with the recent Amazon unionization failure effort, it seems to me that it has shifted to the political. I, the two are irrevocably intertwined. Um, 
the political and economic struggle because reform from the political end is to affect on the economic end in general. And I would say with respect to the Amazon union, it is, uh, it is quite unfortunate that that couldn't have calcified into like an, a full on thing. And it, I, I would say that I wouldn't put the validity of unions into question, but it is kind of a sad state of affairs when union unions and unionization as a trend has been in decline. So my question is, if unions are not the way forward and if the old ways of class struggle and the old ways of resistance are not the ways forward, then what are, you know, like I'm not married. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now, man. I'm not married to like any particular tactic or strategy. I just want to know what works, you know, like what are ways that we can leverage our power, our labor against the ruling class, which grant us material gains and bring us closer to socialism, you know? So, yeah, to me, the primary form that seems to have is disrupting the political machines and the political system. Um, in the past, Bernie was an example of that. Even Trump was an example of that. Right. That had a profound effect on the political system. And what I'm focusing right now on is just a general popular third party, not even necessarily the Communist Party, although I think the Communist Party should strive to have a leading role in such a popular uh, front, which, but it would have to prove itself to do that. But I think a third party, which would disrupt the current two-party system, political system, is the best way forward because um, it can unite the people across their various geographic and economic and, you know, uh, even political differences. Uh, so to me, that's really what I'm focused on is how can... I best serve the cause and the aim of building a real third party alternative to the Republicans and Democrats. And again, I, I I don't think the Communist Party will be this third party. I think I look at things like the People's Party or whoever else is capable of doing it. Just a very general, democratic, popular third party. Yeah, so I've criticized the People's Party in the past. Um, I see some elements of uh semi-socialistic elements at least with their emphasis on nationalized industry and cooperatives i've read like their party plan in the past um i feel like my biggest issue with the people's party is it really is just spontaneous and just an organic like just people being sick of it you know people are just sick of things the way they are and i think what the people's party and people that work within it really need are good theory now Pulling the Democrats left is a fool's errand. I'm sure, like, you ain't pulling them Democrats left. They're going to pull you right before you pull yeah, them Yeah, I agree. Right. Yeah, no, like, if you look, look at, like, I mean, I'm not to name, you know, not to name any names here, you know, a certain somebody you debated a while ago. Yeah, Vosh. Yeah, right. not going to name any names, but this man tried to do that, and look what he's doing now. He's doing apologetics for children in cages. He's saying if we don't pull out of if we pull out of Afghanistan, China's going to take it over and it's going to be the sequel to the Khmer Rouge. You know what I mean? So like bread to people like that are not helping the cause. But uh, I, th I see within the makings of the People's Party, the PSL, the Green Party, and even in like the DSA, even in the DSA, even though it is relatively wedded to the Democrats, I see potential for like a breeding ground for more radical politics. Uh, but ultimately what we need is like more comprehensive theory, better theory. Um, if there's one thing I've noticed amongst the left in general is that people don't fucking read enough, you know, and that theory could be utilized and put into place because, you know, theory feeds into practice. And when I see like the people's party, I see a party that, you know, well-intentioned, the road to hell is paved on good intentions, but without good theory and without like a good ideological base, preferably based in Marxism-Leninism, I see a lot of room, like an ideological vacuum that can be filled by opportunists, you know? Yeah, well, I, I don't actually see the People's Party as a proletarian party, right? To me, the working class party has to be a communist party, right? And I think that that has to be the communist party whichever direction um, it has to go in, it'll be the Communist Party. Uh, but but the, the thing is, is that the proletarian party has to prove it, that its leadership among the people 
And it has to work in the popular front, basically, of the broad strata of the people and prove that the proletarian party is the best equipped to lead this general struggle against the establishment. Um, and that's something it has to prove based on the correctness of the theory. The theory has to be proven by the correctness of insight in practice within this practical struggle. Um, and so the People's Party having opportun opportunists isn't really a problem to me because um, what's important is that there's just a solid ground and there's a solid base of, of some kind of popular front, some kind of popular alternative to the establishment that a wide ranging uh, strata of political forces can coalesce around. Even, even some may be on the right. It doesn't really matter. Libertarians, whatever. Um, and it's on that ground that I think communists who are equipped ideologically with um, the theoretical truth and insight of Marxism Leninism should seek to strive hegemony. So the Communist Party today has a certain t uh, strategy where it's interpreting the popular front as the Democratic Party being the popular front and that the Communist Party should work within the Democrats and kind of, you know, lead the effort to fight the Republicans. And where I'm coming from, basically... Oh, Voidburn, thank you so much, man. Uh, give me a second, but thank you so much. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the popular front, as far as the Communist Party is concerned, uh, to me, has to be an alter a third party. It has to be an alternative to the two-party system because both the Democrats and Republicans are starting to be threats to the American formal democracy, which... The Popular Front strategy, in the, as far as being an anti-fascist strategy, was meant to be communists leading the struggle to protect popular and formal democracy against fascism. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Communist Party thinks that the Republicans are fascists and the DSA are the Popular Front, and I disagree with that. I think the Popular Front will be something like a third party. And again, the third party uh, is not going to be ideologically Love pure. It's probably not going to be filled with people with correct theoretical insights, but it will be a broad platform for the American people disaffected with the establishment to rally behind. I mean, ideology here is not so much that important as much as uh, being a material platform for the American people. Now, ideology is important, but it has to come after or at least code temporally with having this material foundation of having some kind of platform of the people. A platform of the people, you say? Yeah, and by that, I don't mean an ideological slogan. I, I mean something that gives expression to the material dissatisfaction the American people have with the establishment, regardless of how they're ideologically interpreting that. Just something that's common enough and vague enough um, to not have to be one ideological articulation of that dissatisfaction. There's a general dissatisfaction. Some interpret it by being leftist. Some interpret it by being rightist. But there is a material dissatisfaction with the establishment. Yeah, yeah. So that's ultimately where we come in. Because the system as we know it is fundamentally, it doesn't work. Capitalism in the grand scheme of things, doesn't work. The goal of an economic system is to provide people with wealth, it's to provide people with good living, and it's meant to meet people's needs. And as the system we has now, it does a pretty piss-poor job at that. I mean, yeah, there's you can point to a reform here, you can point to a welfare check there that can buy people off for a little while, but ultimately, the system doesn't work because it, the ruling class is always waging an assault on what little non-market uh, relations or non-market means of subsisting exists. So I think that's where we come in uh, to talk about how the system fails to reform and how it fails to change. And we talk about we talk about the failures and the shortcomings of the system because as the system fails, it creates a breeding ground for more radical politics for real social change, and that uh, and that. I mean, on the other hand, we should also, through direct action, mutual aid, you know, working on the ground, uh, 
we can help people that are in need as well. Um, right now, I, occasionally I volunteer. I go to a soup kitchen once every few weeks and, uh, you know, I feed, feed the homeless, I partake in a Marxist reading circle from time to time. I don't do nearly as much work on the ground as I used to, man. Um, honestly, part of the reason why is because I work full time now, but you know, back in my heyday, I was part of the PSL. I don't know. Are you? I know you're affiliated with the CPUSA. Um, how's that going? Well, I'm not joining the party. I don't have any intentions on joining the party because um, what I've learned, and I have some experience uh, in organizations, as a very heterodox thinker who has views that go against the mainstream and go against culturally, theoretically, whatever you want to do it, um, I'm a troublemaker, right? If I join the CPUSA, I will cause a level of disruption in that party that I fear will lead to an operational disruption. A party is also a business, right? It's a corporation. It has to smoothly acquire funds, pay for its expenses, and work. It has to just operationally work. Like, for example, I always use this example. During China's Cultural Revolution, um... The, the state and the economy ceased to be operational, right? Because of this kind of cultural revolution that was going on. The same thing is true for disruptions within parties, right? That's how parties get wrecked. So I choose to be at a distance from the CPUSA and have all of the kind of quote unquote cultural revolution and ideological and theoretical disagreements that can just, I use the media platform as a platform for that rather than an official organ of a party just so I can have the freedom to express my views about the future direction of the party and what I think without doing it internally and, and, and mistaking that for the, the day-to-day business-like operations of the party. So there, there are day-to-day business-like operations of the party that need to be fulfilled. Whether you agree with the CPUSA or not, if you join the party, you have to professionally commit yourself to carrying out the orders, following its program, uh attending to the day-to-day business so it can be operational and i want it to be operational right and if i'm somebody who wants to radically alter the course of the cpusa it's better for me to do that on my own media platform um where i won't i won't be a threat to their operational uh i won't use them as my platform right because if i use them as my platform uh that'll disrupt their their operations basically Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, I guess I want to roll things back a bit. Um, I guess I'll... Uh, man, I don't really know where else to go with. I am going to head off here in a minute because my girlfriend wants me and, you know, duty calls and all that other jazz. I'm sure you know all about that. But uh, yeah, all in all, one thing that part of the reason why I'm here is because I wanted to... Because Jason and Caleb aren't cool right now. As far as I can tell, Caleb did something on Twitter that was admittedly pretty shitty, like not cool. Jason is a sensitive person, I'm sure you know, right? And again, like I listening to you talking to you right now, like again, like I feel like a lot of the disagreements that you know the Jason Unruh crowd and cast, as well as the Moppinite cast, uh, you guys have more in common than not, and I feel like a lot of this could be worked out and compromised if there was just a communication between the two. Um, and because Jason tried to discuss or talk to Caleb, I'm sure you know, but I guess Caleb just ignored it, didn't have time, whatever. Caleb posted a tweet, Jason got offended by it, but, you know, Jason's been a source of radicalization for a lot of people, and I don't think he's somebody that's really worth leaving behind, you know, so... I guess what I'm trying to say is I want to bring us all together. Like, I know yeah. that, uh, well, right. You know what I mean? Like not. Yeah. Me. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. I mean, th- the reason it's difficult for me to follow all this stuff is because I'm primarily on Twitch, right? Yeah. And Twitch is a very isolated place. Um, politically. Right. So it's kind of just me and Jackson here on Twitch. Uh, you know, if more quote unquote tankies want to come on Twitch and, and start, you know, going on these panels and, you know, uh, adding some, you know, chaos to the mix. I think we would both, you know, welcome that development because really we are dealing with just liberals and Democrats here. Um, 
Yeah. And there's there's really not a lot of tankies on Twitch, but I think more the stuff you're talking about is more on the YouTube scene, which yeah, you know, I'm I, I'm just not really within, and and YouTube yeah. is also very it's not it's not that big in terms of networking either. You know, it's like YouTube it just has so much of a diversity of content that different YouTube communities are just hard to maintain. Gotcha, gotcha. Um. So you think that if someone like me, like, cause I've noticed you've gotten a lot of growth in recent months, dude, you have been like, don't get me wrong. Like since our last little debacle, I've doubled my subscriber count, but you have yeah. fucking surged. Like you're at like 10,000 subscribers. Um, you think Twitch, if I were to hop on Twitch, it would help me out. Um, there's a few things I can help you out on. So I can help you get on panels, right? If you want to get on these panels, um i can you know message them and tell them to get you on um that will definitely be a source of growth as far as uh you know your growth is concerned um i would i would greatly appreciate that dude yeah. hey uh, i just want to say um i'm just gonna go ahead because i gotta go here like i said but uh i just want to say real quick that um i know we got off to a rough start but like i said we have more in common than not and I apologize for any and all misconduct in the past. I, I just want to wash away any. Yeah, look, look, it's it's the thing is, is that at the end of the day, like, I don't know you. You don't know me. It's just all stuff on the Internet. And uh, so yeah, the moment. yeah um, um, but I mean, like, I did the whole burn notice thing to you. And I mean, I did that really as just retaliation just because I was mad because I was pissed off. Yeah. Um, but. Honestly, dude, I'm glad we were able to bury the hatchet tonight. Um, and uh, if we're able to bury the hatchet on Jason's end, one thing I'd like to see out of all this is to see Jason and Caleb back together, you know, talking together because Jason is pissed at Caleb. Caleb is done with Jason, you know. And when communists are dividing one another this much, we're doing the FBI's work for them. So... I think if there was some degree of compromise, some degree of unity, and some degree of uh, willingness to understand one another's positions before we just start calling each other LARPers and ultras and opportunists and all that other jazz, um, I feel like uh, we could be a much more potent force. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, all I can say is that, you know, my mind has been focused on Twitch here and Twitch, I'm really trying to break through with this Twitch um uh... Twitch is a very insular political community, and you know it's my real goal here is to um, to break through here, and you know see if more communities, political communities, can form than the ones that exist now. So, you know, um, I really think when when it comes to this stuff, you know, uh, to me, the more anti-establishment voices are here on Twitch. Uh, the more is better. That's just my view. You know, the more of that comes here, the more, um, you know, because at the end of the day, like what really is distinguishing communists? I really see the new wave of ideology coming from um, this new wave of liberals, right? I just see this as like people are just, it's hard to see when you're in kind of a commu ideological community, but from an outside perspective, I really see this kind of liberal uh this new wave of liberalism starting to really take over so yeah and it's it's kind of it's pretty gross dude it's a yeah. bunch of liberals that it's a bunch of people that think they're left but really they're larping leftists they're not really left they're they're leftists in words but liberal indeed um but uh hey man it's been good talking to you um i'm glad we were able to sort things out um but I'm going to go ahead and head out, man, because like I said, I got a needy girlfriend that's hitting me up. But uh, it was good talking to you, dude. Um, okay. You have a good rest of the night, man. Okay, you too. See you later. Yeah, take it easy. Talk sometime soon.
Yo, there's a guy I might debate. Look, guys, right now, DGG is the fucking enemy. That's as far as I see it. DGG is the true enemy. So, anyone and every, Anyone and everyone... We can... Whoever can come on Twitch, bring their communities, we all... Because those people have a network. They do have a network. You know, they have a network. We should bring our own network, you know? We should bring our own network. I don't care who I don't care who dude I don't care who I really don't bring anyone bring anyone all we got to do is uh face this you know so right now we can fight later but yeah tankies all the tankies it doesn't matter how ridiculous they are how absurd they are how much I find them cringe how much I disagree with them come on over to twitch I'm finally calling out to you. I've been ignoring you guys for a long time, neglecting you for a long time. Come on over to Twitch, and um, we're gonna make this. Uh, we're gonna spice things up a little bit, so to speak. We're gonna spice things up a little bit, right? You know, I was watching Marco Polo, the show Marco Polo, and you know, you know how I feel about the YouTube tankies. After all is said and done, all the shit we've been through with them, I kind of feel like they're like the other Khans that are just still in Mongolia. Like, I'm Kublai Khan. I, I conquered, um, he conquered China in the show, right? Kublai Khan. But all the other Khans are still in Mongolia, right? And I'm kind of, I'm saying, okay, Khans, come. We're going to have some backup. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I'm thinking about it. We're going to do a curl tie, whatever that council they have. All of the other tankies that are on YouTube, they're still in Mongolia on YouTube, you know? And whether they're enemies or friends, it don't matter. Friends or enemies is not important. I'm bringing them here, bringing up the people. That's where I came from, too. I came from YouTube. I don't forget my roots. I came from YouTube, you know? And I'm at enough of an arm's length with them to not have to be defined by them. Like, my biggest worry back then was that I would have to be defined by these people that I just am very different from and I disagree with. But now that I've grown to a sufficient level, you know, the cons, the cons can come. Um, be bannermen, you know, be bannermen. That's kind of what I'm thinking about now, you know? We get, we already got Jackson here, but it'd be nice if we got others too, you know? We need a tanky takeover of political Twitch is the goal. A tanky takeover of political Twitch. It's kind of how I'm thinking, you know? And, and, you know, what do I got to lose experimenting? 